So I am really excited about this next um, presentation. Um, in particular, how are large media companies and news organizations navigating this landscape and this opportunity? How can they map climate change, sustainability, and basically get us as their emerging audiences engaged? Social media in particular has a major impact on the way in which stories are shared and told throughout the world. There's a digital media company that is currently leading this revolution. Now this news is trying to creatively connect with the next generation of news consumers concerned about climate change. I would like to introduce first Lucy Biggers, who's producer, and now this. <laughs> and one of my favorite people on the planet, next to my son, and my mom, if she's watching. <laughs> it's not, it's one of the best things about, about being a educator um, and a content creator is when your mentees become masters. So now I'm going to introduce you to uh, Zinkle Essamwa, a two-time uh, GW alum, her first degree um, in journalism and mass communications from SNPA, and then she decided to stay because why not and get a master's degree, and now she is currently killing it at Now This, and she's gonna come and share with us uh, some storytelling techniques. Zinkle. See how I did that? Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hi. Hello. Dr. Cheers is great, isn't she? I still call her Dr. Cheers. So hi, my name is Zinkle Esamwa, and I'm here with Now This News to walk you through what we're gonna talk about today. We call it stories that move, but really we're just talking about stories with impact, persuasive storytelling, how do you do that? Uh, and so I'll first break down who we are as Now This, what we do, why we do it, and then I'll kind of walk you through our specific tactics for telling impactful stories, and then Lucy will specifically come up here and talk to you about how she does that with climate and environmental storytelling. So a little bit more about me. Hi, I'm Zing Clay. You, why don't we try saying my name? Because I know it's tricky. Zing Clay. Zing Clay. Cool, you can ask me again. I know it's hard. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. As Dr. Cheers said, I'm a two-time GW alum. I spent a lot of time, too much time, in this building. Uh, and I'm actually also a Planet Forward alum. My first, the first video I ever cut was for Planet Forward, fun fact. So thanks for the skills. They were helpful. Uh, and now I work as a host and correspondent at Now This News, where I host our daily evening news show, Know This. I hope you check it out. It's on Instagram and Facebook. And Lucy and I encourage you to interact with us online during this presentation. You'll see our handle, so please engage. Uh, so a bit more about Now This. We are a digital media company. How many of you have seen a Now This video? Cool. That's exciting. Uh, and so we exist almost exclusively on social media. So we're on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and whatever else exists, Twitter. Uh, and we believe in the power of video and the power of it to really impact young people. We were founded in 2012. We have an office here in DC that I founded. We're headquartered in New York City. And we also have offices in Philadelphia, LA, and San Francisco. And so a bit more about our framework for telling stories with impact. I'm gonna walk us through the different means and ways that we do that. And that's mainly through medium, messaging, timing, and people. These are core, so why don't we say that back? I wanna keep us awake here. Medium, messaging, timing, and people, cool. Okay, so let's jump into medium. Today there are so many mediums that you can use to tell stories. This picture is from one of our live streams. Live, I think this is being live streamed, right? So we did two and a half hours of live streams during the State of the Union where we interviewed myself and the senior politics producer, interviewed different members of Congress, including um, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, about the State of the Union. And I think live streams are a really powerful medium that can be used to tell stories with impact if you're a student or someone who's actively in the field, right? If something's going on right now, live streams can be a great almost public forum where people can talk and comment uh, and engage with each other online. And so that's a key medium that we use. We both live stream kind of just congressional meetings that are happening, but also any protests or other notable events. Another medium, is documentary. I think documentaries are increasingly popular these days. 
Um, and the reason these are so powerful and impactful, we found, is because it's going doing a deep dive into a specific issue. At Now This, we have something called Now This Reports. I encourage you to check it out, Now This Reports. And those are kind of our mini docs or long form or feature documentaries where we go deep into an issue. This screenshot is from Mothers Separated by Borders. It's one of our reports, and we have many others. One of them was just nominated for an Amnesty International Award, and that focused on the crisis in Syria. We have some on the opioid crisis in the US. So there are so many topics, but documentaries um, are a way, as I said, of doing a deep dive. So I encourage a lot of students in the room to not shy away from that. I think sometimes we see these really well done videos and we're like, oh my gosh, we could never do that. Uh, but on the right, you see the minority vote. That's a documentary I actually produced with help from Dr. Cheers um, during my time at GW. That's the first time I created two documentaries during my time here. And so really, when engaging with that, it's important to think about, well, what issue am I interested in? What do I want to learn more about? And documentaries are a great way to start that. Another medium that we use at Now This is investigative reports. Um, and these are some uh, a space where you can really have tangible impact. This specific investigative report was about uh, inequality in the Deep South. And so one of our senior correspondents went to Louisiana and discovered real disparities between schools that were predominantly white and predominantly black. This video, you might have seen it, it got about 40 million views on Facebook alone uh, and resulted in tangible legal action. The judge actually cited this video in his court order and said, I, this video has come to my attention and I need some answers. Yeah, that's a pretty big deal. And so we're actually doing a follow-up piece now that that, uh, that hearing has happened and to see what is going to happen uh, as a result of this piece. But really, investigative reports are a space for tangible action to happen. So I know, and again, I want to make this accessible. If you're a student, you might be like, well, I don't work for the Post. I don't work for Now This. How could I do an investigative report? It really starts with a question. What's an issue? What's something that I'm not cool with that I want to change? Uh, and then start doing the research. Start calling people. I know we don't really like to call people these days, but cold calls are really powerful. Ask what's going on, why is it happening? Uh, and investigative reports are a way to do that. And something that's very popular, I think a lot of people have opinions and views and voice is super, super important in the media um, industry today. And so explainers and op-eds are another medium that we use at Now This. Uh, think of essentially a New York Times op-ed, but in video form. So we get an expert, an impacted individual to speak to an issue passionately. This is something you can create yourself uh, if you are an expert or you want to speak specifically to an issue. And then last but not least, one of our mediums that we're very well known for is our breaking news coverage. Um, specifically in the political realm, if you follow now this politics, you can see a lot of our breaking news stories. And as journalists, we always aim to be at the front lines. But the reality is that a lot of times you are the first person on the scene. Before a first responder, before a journalist, it's just civilians on the street. And so I always encourage people, your phone is such a powerful tool. Don't be afraid to document. Don't be afraid to film, because a lot of times outlets are looking for that content to share. And so this is medium. These are the mediums we use at Now This. Can we say medium? medium? All right, so we're gonna move on to messaging. Messaging is a bit simpler, and I like to focus it on a few core questions we ask every day in our newsroom um, to focus and ho uh, simplify our messaging. The first, which was touched on a bit earlier, who is my audience? A lot of people jump into a story and don't even know who they want to be speaking to, but do think about that as you're crafting your stories. Next, do I understand what's being said? I think everyone wants to sound smart and fancy and use many syllables, um, or use as much footage as possible, or make the longest video possible, but many times, uh, you might be losing the meat of the matter. So really think about, do I understand what's being said? What's the most compelling part? Uh, today, a lot of us create our own content, and as a result, we can get kind of attached to it. We're like, oh, every part of this is amazing, and every part of it needs to be included. The reality is that's probably not true. So try and identify what the most compelling parts of your story are, um, and use and include those. What emotion am I trying to convey? Uh, if you've been on Facebook, you've probably seen the reaction options, right? You can like, you can, what is it? It's like, haha, -ha, angry, sad. Yes. Uh, and those can actually be a good metric for what emotion you're 
kind of activating in your audience. And so think about that as you're crafting stories as well. And the last two, how will I get users to finish and share? Today, people have really, really short attention spans. We know this, we acknowledge this at Now This, um, but how can you get people to stay and stick around? And honestly, the answer is substance. People ask us every day, well, how do you get these viral videos? How do we make them? We do not sit in rooms and think about how can we make a viral video? We think about substance and how can we tell a really meaningful story? And from there, people stick around and watch. And lastly, would you watch this? Um, when we're pitching stories at Now This, a big thing we say is if you wouldn't watch it, why are you making it, right? Of course, sometimes you need to feed people their vegetables. Like there's some content people just need to know. Um, but otherwise, be thinking about that question. OK, that was messaging. Can we say messaging? messaging. Cool. Next, timing. That's one of our big frameworks um, at Now This. And it's kind of simple to understand. This is a photo from one of our live streams during the 2016 presidential election. We had about four concurrent streams with different things. There were people literally sitting on the street doing like casual interviews. This is our senior correspondent sitting with an expert. Um, and timing is key because if you make a beautiful, powerful film, but you share that story two years too late, it might not get the attention it needs. So really thinking about, OK, what issues are coming up in the future, or what's not being covered, but really we could have change now. Um, think about that as you're crafting your stories, because that's what we do at Now This. And lastly, our last framework, but not least, is people. People, people, people. At the end of the day, stories that have impact and stories that move um, tell very powerful individual stories. I think earlier on, the, on a panel, someone was talking about how people want to go national, and they think, OK, I just have to be broad. But actually, the more specific you are, a lot of times, the more impactful you can be. This photo is from Parkland, Florida. I spent two weeks reporting there after the awful tragedy at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. And one of the most powerful things was seeing these students who had witnessed this horrific act just speak up and speak their truth. Um, there's a TED talk that's super popular and it talks about the power of a single story. And literally the stories of these young students led to a giant movement known as, do we know what it was called? March for our lives, right? And it's not the first youth-led movement. I never say that, right? There was Black Lives Matter. There have been so many. Um, but I think it really highlights the power individuals have. So as you're also shaping your stories, don't underestimate the power of people. And another example, I think we all know Flint, right, in this room. A big way that got into the limelight was mothers saying, this water is killing my children. Right? It was their stories that really had impact. And so this is kind of big picture, how we go about finding, identifying, and telling stories that move. And now I'm going to have Lucy come up here and talk about how she does that specifically through climate and the environment. So let's give it up for Lucy. Thank you. Just click that. And this is your job. Thank you. Thank you, Zinkley. Zinkley is so amazing. She's skilled on so many levels. It's like the Zinkley fandom right now. We're like, <laughs> she's amazing. Um, my name is Lucy Biggers, and I'm a producer and host with Now This. And Zinkley really gave us the uh, wider look at Now This. And I'm going to kind of just zoom in and talk about my specific experience um, there. I started in 2015, and I was a um, associate producer. And I learned from my time at Now This a few things that I'm going to walk you through now. And hopefully, students in the audience or anyone, any stage of life, um, these will inspire you as well. So I'm going to talk about how curiosity has informed my decision making and what stories I choose to tell. I'm going to talk about how making connections can really level up your stories and help you discover stories that you would have otherwise not known about. And then, of course, how storytelling can have an impact. Um, and now more than ever, with social media and how connected we are, I think that's a huge one. So let's start off with follow your curiosity. Um, when I started at Now This in 2015, I was associate producer, video editor. My job when they hired me was to come in, look at what the breaking news was, what was the trending news, and just like turn as many videos as I could in a day. And it was great because I really got my feet wet. Oh, also, you can see the old Now This branding up in the corner. It's a little cut off, but this is from over three years ago. But that experience at the top of, the, uh, of my time at Now This um, really allowed me to get my feet wet. And I became a faster editor, learned the Now This voice. But I knew I wanted to tell a story that I was really passionate about, something that I was really curious about. So after a few months of you know, really proving myself, I was on the lookout for a good story. And one day, I saw an obscure article about microbeads, the little plastic beads that are in our face wash and body wash. 
and they were getting banned in the US and no one was really talking about it, wasn't making the news. And I said, I'm really interested in this. I wanna do a story on this. And so I went to my manager and I said, can I make a video about microbeads? And he said, sure, go for it. So we went down to the Dwayne Reed, the drugstore, bought face wash with microbeads in it. I'm sorry, only time I've ever done that, but we needed it as a prop. And we did some B-roll. Um, this is my finger with the microbeads on it. And we filmed that video, did a quick script, and we put that video out to our audience. Within a day, that video had a million views. And by the end of the week, that video had six million views. And so I had taken this obscure article that I was curious about, something I was a little uh, passionate about, and here we were. Um, with all the, having a huge impact. And so it really made me trust my curiosity. And I go, okay, I gotta find the next story. So after that, um, sustainability really became my beat. And I was covering um, you know, startups that were doing cool things around sustainability. Maybe they're planting a tree for every uh, shirt that they sell, or there's an activist movement or whatever it was. And in early 2016, I got turned on to Standing Rock, uh, the big protest about an oil pipeline happening in North Dakota. So here I was on my computer in Manhattan, June 2016, nobody's talking about Standing Rock. And I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going into Facebook groups and there's people there and they're saying that they're getting attacked by dogs or they're, they're getting arrested and held in cages. And so I'm just reaching out to people on Facebook, messaging them, going, what's going on? Do you have any footage? Can you send it to me? Um, really don't know what I'm doing other than I'm trying to get to the bottom of this story. Um, that six months period of reporting culminated with me and two of my coworkers going to Standing Rock. We were there when President Obama put the project on hold and everybody in the camp was celebrating. There were thousands of people there, veterans, all these different people had traveled there. And I could have never known that just making those connections in this group six months prior would have led me to this experience of witnessing history at Standing Rock. And not to like really lean on our numbers, but <laughs> we looked back and we calculated how many views our coverage of Standing Rock got over that period of time, May 2016 to like January 2017, and it was 97 million views on social media. And like I, a lot of it is me in Facebook groups like just pulling stuff. So you really just never know when you're making connections and you're meeting people on the ground what impact and reach you can have. So um, my final chapter um, that I wanna talk about is having an impact. So coming back from Standing Rock, more than ever, I was like, wow, the environment, climate change is the cause of our generation and I need to really focus on this fully and make this my beat. I didn't, I didn't study environmental science, I didn't um, you know, do anything around the environment prior to just working at Now This and like following my passion and curiosity. And all of a sudden, here I was with all this experience and all these connections in the space. But I also felt like environmental journalism is either like really unattainable and unrelatable or it's so doom and gloom that you shut off when you see these headlines that are like, we have 12 years to like save the planet. Um, and so I really wanted to frame things in a way that was approachable and could inspire people to take action. And that's when we came up with the idea for my series, which is called One Small Step, which I host and produce as well. We've filmed the first season, there's eight episodes. You guys can watch it now online. I'm gonna show you now um, the preview of our first season, if it, there we go. I'm Lucy Biggers and this is One Small Step. Sometimes I feel overwhelmed by climate change. But instead of being hopeless, I'm gonna be proactive and figure out how I can live more sustainably. From single-use plastic. Well, I've committed to give up single-use plastic for the entire month. I got my sandwiches, no plastic involved. To composting. I'm on a mission to find out how my old food gets turned into compost. To clothing recycling and more. I'm excited to explore how to live a more responsible life. It's so crazy. And along the way, learn from the change makers who are leading us to a greener world. I definitely don't have all the answers, but you've got to start somewhere. And I hope you'll come along for the ride. Yay! <laughs> so um, that series just went out at the beginning of the year. There's eight episodes that are on our Facebook page. We're going to have a YouTube channel that's launching. You'll be able to find them there. Uh, and it's been so gratifying for me in my career so far because I get people that message me all the time on Instagram or however they find me and they're like, hey, I started composting because of you. Like, oh, I got my dad to stop using plastic bags. Uh, I get messages like that multiple times per week or they'll say like, you're so positive around the environment. Like it's so inspiring. And for me, 
it's this like full circle moment where I'm looking back at my path from making that first video about microbeads, that tiny little thing to being here now. And I never could have imagined that that one choice would have led me to where I am now. And I'm just so excited about the momentum, momentum behind it. I'm working on season two right now. We're gonna be doing really cool things. We're gonna go travel to cities that are transitioning to 100% renewable energy. I'm gonna go learn about uh, people who are growing gardens on their lawns. And uh, what else? I'm exploring reusables. Shout out Tom from Loop and TerraCycle. And so there's just so much excitement. Like I've never been more passionate and excited. And I want to leave you guys on a really important note because I know you guys are all students and you don't have now this. You're not, you don't work there right now, not yet. Um, but I want to make this point that I think everyone's been making on this uh, a, a conference today, and that's that no story is too small. You guys are the most empowered generation in the history of the world because you have your phones in your pockets with a camera and you have a social network where you can connect to anyone anytime. And if I was gonna give you one piece of advice that I wish I knew at your age is that any story that you wanna tell has value. Something that's the most obvious thing in the world to you could be mind blowing to somebody from a different community. So. Don't think that any, don't wait and go, well, when I have the good camera, when I have the big breaking news, it's like, no. Tell the stories now, start small, share it out to your friends, share it to your family, and you have no idea where they're gonna go. And to just like bring this home for you, uh, I love doing this on my Instagram stories. I have a few things that I do just to engage with people who have watched my show, and one of them, well, you're gonna see it, but I'll just, in case it's confusing, Instagram is fast, but one of them is I pick up uh, trash off the street and then I throw it away, and I'm like, guys, if I didn't pick this up, could have gone into the ocean. I'm, t I'm, I'm a spoiler. I'm just gonna let you watch it. <laughs> it will make sense. Today and things I found on the street that I'm throwing away. Bye bye. So I've got my compost. I'm at Union Square. I'm gonna drop it off. I actually haven't composted in a few months because I changed apartments. I haven't been doing a lot of cooking. This is my first compost drop off. In a while. And I just take my compost. And then, nice little. There you go. So there, that's my point, guys. No story is too small. I think you guys all have stories that you should tell. Take, take your power, tell those stories, and you have no idea who you can impact. Just where I go. Thank you, thank you. Yay! That was awesome. <laughs> you all should follow Lucy on Instagram. It's super fun. <laughs> if you haven't already, watch the show. Um, so, ladies, for the sake of, I've been giving my cues, um, but I have one question that I want to turn off to the audience because I'm sure there are like just really excitement coming from there. Um, you all are both storytellers, and from a stand-up correspondent to now, you know, correspondent obviously doing your own show, um, what do you think, what types of stories in particular do you think gets the most, the biggest reaction, the biggest impact? Go, what are you mm. thinking? I would say um, stories, as I said earlier, with substance and that challenge something. Mm -hmm. One of our most viral videos I think ever. Uh, did anyone see the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez video campaign finance? Yeah. I'm seeing some nods. Mm -hmm. So that is actually now the most viewed video featuring any politician ever on Twitter. Wow. Um, and it's wow. literally just her sitting there in a chair asking questions about campaign finance law. Nothing really compelling was happening other than her asking questions. Mm -hmm. But I think stories that like really move and impact people are the mm -hmm. ones where it's just compelling. And it's like Lucy said, you never know what people are interested in, like campaign finance law isn't sexy. Yeah. <laughs> but, but she is, I will say, she is, right. she's very cool. is, I mean, I don't normally fangirl over politicians <laughs> at all, unless it's like Maxine Waters. Um, <laughs> but AOC is, I mean, she she's, is someone who just gets people engaged. And she's our generation, so I think she yeah. knows how to really hit those notes that she almost probably in her brain knows what, what to say to also make it go viral. Yeah. But there is substance there, and I, I agree. I think it's like, you know, crashing up against something, like Kaylin said before us, like, and trying to tr create change. And like, one video also I found, like, it did really well for me a few years ago, was a video about a vertical farm. And mm -hmm. I just showed this vertical farm, it was like really cool music, and I was like, this vertical farm uses like 95% less water, but like, yeah. creates 100 times more food. And right. everyone was like, what? Mind blowing, right? And I think that we're at this time where like, there's all this cool innovation happening. Yeah. There's so much going on. And people just are hungry for it. We're so overdue despair. Sure. Like, and so AOC represents like the future of politics. Right. And like that video represents the future of farms. And so I think really like showing people like 
this could be where we're going, I think always really excites me. So I think it excites viewers as well. Well, I know Tom uh, Zaki this morning who we talked about that positivity. So as yeah. you mentioned, like I love with your with your Instagram stories how you can say, hey, like look, I've, if if I didn't pick up this straw yeah. or this whatever, you know, look at me composting and yeah. and yes, I'm going to the place and like all of these ways in which we you can inspire instead of shaming right i think is also really for sure interesting and important and you guys are inspiring <laughs> millions so i love it um questions because we're standing between you all and lunch yes ma'am <laughs> straight to the back please introduce yourself um so my name is ayana davis i'm from mizzacorn university and that's in dallas pa if anyone watches the office is where scranton was uh the office <laughs> filmed in scranton so that's how everybody knows um but you mentioned during your presentation about um, being able to connect with people. And um, through sitting in this conference, and I don't mean to be too chatty, but through sitting in this conference, I realized that there was not a topic that was really approached. And I feel like it would be really good to talk to you guys about. So um, for me, I feel like when it comes to talking to people, I feel like there's this disconnect because people don't know how to talk to other cultures and other backgrounds. And I feel like that's where it starts. And in order for all these issues and all of these things that are to be met that we're talking about, I feel like it first starts with that, the communication aspect between different cultures and between different people and understanding and knowing how to communicate with those people because professors these days are even failing to communicate with their students and properly edu improperly educating them because they don't know how to speak to us. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, when you say it all depends on our audience and our people, another thing that comes to mind is how do you get people to care? Because I know going to my school, I you know, am fighting for people to listen and hear and understand and want to do other things, but it's also hard to get people to care when society has built this road that everybody wants to follow or that everybody wants to stay on the same path. So it's really hard to get people to care. So for me, how do you get those people in your audience to truly care about your message, your passion, and how are you perceiving that to go against all cultures and different backgrounds. Thank you so much. That was a great question. Yeah. I think there's really two important. questions mm -hmm. in there. Um, so I want to okay. I want to break it down so that we answer everything like accordingly. Yeah. But yeah, so sort of like how do you speak to different cultures and backgrounds? And yeah. then sort of the second, how do you kind of get your mm -hmm. message across? Yeah, I think uh, with cultures and backgrounds, one, I would say you have to be OK being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And you kind of have to put your pride down, uh, which we saw like with Lucy. She was like, I didn't know what microbeads were. I was just going to go and figure it out. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'd start there. Learn to be uncomfortable and put yourself in spaces where that's happening. If you are going to spaces and everyone looks like you and thinks like you, it's going to make it harder to tell good stories because mm -hmm. it's going to feel distant because you are distant. Right. Yeah. So I think a lot of it, someone asked earlier about like how do you engage, like I'm also a filmmaker, I do video, and you asked about like how do you engage people in photo without mm -hmm. feeling awkward. Right. It does require putting the camera down and really just like being a person, mm -hmm. which will sometimes be uncomfortable if they're very different from right. you. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would say, I mean, I understand what you're saying and like as like a white woman and I'm going to Native American communities or like I'm talking to a black man who's incarcerated, I'm like very like leading with my heart and like I'm just seeing that person, like I have emotional intelligence to see that person past our differences and what their struggle is. But I understand that not every journalist maybe is able to do that. But mm -hmm. you know, that's why we have so many amazing young people coming up who will have that and that's gonna be second nature for them. And like that is so challenging. So good for you for like putting up the good fight because I imagine it's really difficult to not feel heard by your perspective, but that means that your stories are even, need to be told even more. And so like you, you know, maybe that's gonna be part of your calling is to bridge the gap between different communities and try to um, get those stories out there. But yeah, I definitely don't know. I feel like I have to humble myself a lot because I can be the privileged person in the situation, mm -hmm. historically or whatever, and I just lead with my heart, nice. you know? Because yeah. you have to just connect on a human level before you can connect on anything else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great. Point. Did you have another one? What was this, the second part? We didn't answer. <laughs> I want to make sure we do briefly. Uh, the second part too was how do you get your audience to really care about your message? Oh yeah. I think again, like heart. Like um, and now this, we're such a like uh, we're like emotion. Emotion is really important, which is really weird in uh, with journalism. But like right. when I tell a story of somebody who's struggling, I'm making sure I'm leading with like the human aspect of that person that everybody can relate to. Mm -hmm. Like I'm fearful. I'm in love. I'm whatever it is. Like. That is a universal emotion. And then you can build in the other aspects, the cultural aspects, maybe like have that be later, lead with the most unifying story to start, maybe. Absolutely. No, yeah. it's really good. It's really good. 
Sinclair, anything? Or do we have one more? Do we have another question? Yes, sir, in the front. And then we'll come to the back. Hi, I'm Peter. I'm. Can I this one? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I can okay. hear you. Hi, I'm Peter. I'm with uh, UW Madison. I'm wondering to what extent you consider self-efficacy in your videos, like the uh, the viewers' um, ability to come away from your video with like feeling empowered to actually do something. With Lucy's one small step yeah. videos, I think it's a little easier. But let's say for the uh, education inequality video, what do you? How do you consider self-efficacy, and how do you address yeah. that? Yeah. Thanks, that's a good question and a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think generally when we're out in the field, which is often, we try and ask either the impacted individuals or the experts we're speaking to, what can people do? Like that is always a question yeah. I ask, whether it's an op-ed or something, because like we said, our goal isn't despair. A lot of the things in the world are hard, right? A lot yeah. of the coverage I do is mass shootings and breaking news. Yeah. That's hard, yeah. but, or I'll, I'll say and, <laughs> um, you wanna give people tools. So I think generally we ask, what can people do? And in the videos, that's typically included. That being said, I, I, we don't end every video with like a ribbon yeah. on top. <laughs> yeah. Like this was the issue and it's over the end. Right. No. Like, no, some of it's like, this is the issue, it's still going on. And For sure, we'll follow up. This is where you can learn more, yeah. we'll follow up, engage in this way, and so I think that's how yeah. we do it. More often than not, I feel like with hard breaking news, we're not leaving with that note. That being said, just by telling the story, you're having an impact because you're raising awareness about this and maybe people are gonna be outraged and they're gonna take it into their own hands. So you, you're playing a part, you're shedding light on an issue that's really hard. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just to leave it at that, I, I don't really like that line because I feel bad, but, right. but that's so big and it's important. important. Yeah. 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 I'll do one more, I'll saw hand all the way in the back against the wall, Rachel. Thank you, my name is Jasmine and I'm in the Legislative Affairs Program here at GW um, at the Graduate School of Political Management. Um, but I also have an ecology degree and so my question is, um, when you don't have that science base, can you share with me a little bit about your process of understanding the science so that you can interpret it correctly and then translate it for general audiences? Oh yeah, that's really important. I mean, I think that I just cross my T's and dot my I's in regards to talking to experts and making sure that what I'm saying is accurate. A lot of this stuff I've been reporting on now for like a year and a half, so it's kind of like settled into the back of my brain and I can talk about recycling and composting and climate change with a lot more experience, but not having that at the start, I was just super scared that I was gonna get something wrong. Yeah. So I'm like asking every question and making sure again and again. And I mean, you're not gonna get it right every single time. And so you shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of good. You just have to start, but lean on the experts. There's so many resources. Call someone from a, even if you don't use them in your piece, you can always use the resources of like a university professor and you can just talk to them as an informational call. And then like that will just inform your perspective and then you can go, oh, okay. This is a really important fact to leave in. I can leave that out. But I think then the real special place is when you can make it conversational and really put it in people's, uh, the, how we all talk. And that's right. like something I'm really like getting into now with Instagram stories in my series where I'm like, I'm gonna be honest when I'm confused and be like, this doesn't make sense to me. And be like, wait a minute, if it doesn't make sense to me, it doesn't make sense to you, so this is a good story. Absolutely. And owning that and owning your weaknesses versus like trying to always be perfect, I think like let yourself off the hook. Like right. none of us are perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. And research, as you mentioned, is clearly So much research. Clearly, clearly cool. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Um, do I have time? One more in the back yeah, also. <laughs> Hi, I'm a junior at GW. I actually had a class with Dr. Cheers. Hey again. Um, <laughs> so for the past two years, I've been holding the World Bank accountable for their fossil fuel finance by attending their World Bank meetings to advocate they align their lending portfolio 1.5 degree future. But that itself, that sentence is so complicated. My question is about breaking down these complicated concepts that require that you're studying international development to get people to be mobilized and take action. So I'm wondering how you would break down a concept like international finance and development, how that contributes and locks in a fossil fuel future to a general audience. I mean, I haven't done it yet, so <laughs> more power to you. That's why we need you. Yeah. I mean, some topics when I learn about them, they're very overwhelming to me, and I don't know how to communicate them yet. And then, or and then maybe a year later, after I've been dealing with a topic, I can just all of a sudden converse about it in my yeah. own voice. Yeah. So I think there's a give yourself a break. It takes a lot of time and practice, but 
There's no special sauce, I would say. What do you, what do you think? Yeah, and I would also add the questions I had with messaging. Mm -hmm. Ask those questions for the complicated topics, and it will simplify what you're trying to say. Uh, but it's really time yeah. and practice. But I think lead with those questions of who's my audience, what am I actually trying to say, what's core, and from there, your story will simplify. Or own it and be like, listen, this is really complicated, and it's psycho, and I study this, and I don't get it, but I'm going to give you my three bullet points that you need to understand. Like, or takeaway at least. Or three takeaways, because then at least I feel like if you approach it from that perspective of like, uh, it, it kind of takes the pressure off, and right. then you're like, there's a lot of money, and like few people own it, and like we're all screwed. I don't what know what the story. Is. Like, yeah. But like, <laughs> like I just feel like That's maybe accurate. like you can do that as an exercise for yourself to like loosen up a little bit, and like how would you tell your friends like over a beer or something? Right. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, Lucy or Lucy, good lord, Lucy and Zinclair are gonna be here. Um, for the rest of the day and, and come back this uh, later on this evening uh, because Lucy is going to be on another panel talking about some more interesting things and Sinclair will also be around for the rest of the day. Um, so please engage with them in particular during lunch, which we are getting ready to go to and I am going to stop talking and bring up <laughs> Frank Sesno who can take us to lunch. All right, big round of applause.